Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Crystal Ann Compton and I hope you are having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. I wanted to share with you this wonderful conversation that I just had with Amos Smith. Now Amos has been on a multi-decade journey in the art of centering prayer. Centering prayer is a type of prayer or meditation that was developed many years ago by Father Thomas Keating. And I have some interesting connections to the work of Thomas Keating and also I've always felt personally an affinity with Thomas Keating and also centering prayer. I personally believe that centering prayer, this type of meditation is a gateway to truly, truly profound mystical experiences, which Amos gets into and describes. He also teaches us how to do centering prayer. I feel like this is a really important video that you should make time to watch all the way through because we get into all kinds of different conversations. I do want to say that Amos is a mystical Christian. So he comes at it from the framework of Christianity. We do discuss uh, Jesus, but we also talk about some Buddhist thought and he spent time in India. Um, and he has, uh, he has a very ecumenical vibe. He's very, um, he, his message is for everyone. And what I'm saying is you don't need to be a Christian to do centering prayer, which we discuss. And if you are triggered by talk of Jesus or talk of Christianity, um, then I, I would ask that you maybe just put those kinds of reactions aside and really listen to the message and the energy of what he's sharing. Because again, I think there's so much of value here and I wanted to get it to you. I think we need this now, truly, truly, truly in 2023, we need this now more than ever, this spiritual technology. All right, without further ado, let's get into today's conscious conversation with Amos Smith. Amos Smith is a Quaker counselor and author of the books, Be Still and Listen, Experience the Presence of God in Your Life, and Healing the Divide, Recovering Christianity's Mystic Roots. Amos is also a contemplative arts retreat and workshop leader and has been doing centering prayer for over 20 years. Welcome Amos Smith to the Life Magnetics podcast. Excellent. I'm so happy to have you here. Truly, thank you for being here. I think we should, before we get into some of the questions around centering prayer and what that is, I wanted to just kind of get a little background information on you and maybe what led you to this practice, who you were before and how it has transformed you since doing it. So I was always uh, interested in religion and in meditation. So uh, when I went to college at the University of California at Santa Cruz, my um, my major was religious studies and i tried meditation from a number of different angles uh, the way that resonated most with me was with uh, santa cruz friends meeting the, the quakers but i i really wanted to go more deeply into meditation and i knew that i could live uh cheaply in india and uh and dedicate a lot of time to meditation there so um I decided to to do that, and when I was in India, I studied um, Hindi and Sanskrit um, at the Landar Language School in Northern India, um, and th that was a great experience. But it didn't really um, compel me. It wasn't. Uh, it's just not what I felt like I really wanted to do with my life. But then I did some uh, extended retreats, meditation retreats, while I was there in India, and. Um, and and it, it, I just f fell upon something that was um, deep and profound and compelling and, and experiential and, um, and experience is, you know, uh, um, so important to me. Um, I, I just think if, if, you, if you're just basing something on belief, uh, like a belief system or a belonging system, it's, um, it, it's, it's really... Uh, very limited. But if you are basing something on experience, then that is profound. Um, and that's, you know, that's the basis of knowledge. Uh, I, I think whether it's science or whether it's a spirituality, it's, it has to be uh, rooted in experience. So that's when I really fell in love with meditation. And, um, and then when I got back from India, I, uh, I started uh, following the 
the Benedictine uh, monk uh, Thomas Keating and reading his uh, works and and then doing retreats, uh, you know, where he where he was present, and um, and that's really my my start to um, to going deeply into meditation and the centering prayer. So what's Father Keating like? He's kind of um, my my ex husband and his family are all Catholic, and um, my ex husband was in love with Father Keating and Thomas Merton and Anthony DeMello, and he turned me on to all of these things. And um, so Father Keating for him was kind of just this icon. And I've I've seen interviews with him, and he just seems to exude this like beautiful, beautiful energy. So in meeting him, what were your thoughts about him? What what's he like? What was he like? Well, I think a friend of mine named Ethan uh, from Australia put it best. Uh, you know, he uh, he went into the room where Thomas Keating was at Benedict's monastery, and he had not been meditating, but but all of a sudden he felt like he had been you know meditating for an hour, um, and and he hadn't, but but that's what uh, Keating's presence did for him. Is it just took him to a deeper place, and. Um, and he said that that it felt like um, you know Keating's whole presence was backlit. Um, there was just this light, uh, you know, that was exuding from him. And of course, he's done, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of centering prayer for many, many years, and and many other people experienced the same thing. Um, I think the other thing that extended centering prayer did for Thomas Keating was. The, um, it just gave him profound life force. Um, I mean, in his early 90s, he was jet setting around Europe. I mean, he was a, he was like a rock star in England. Um, he would get off the plane and everybody would, you know, be there welcoming him and cheering him on. And um, he, uh, you know, like a lot of, uh, I think, people who take meditation deeply, um, he um, healed the, his nervous system. And he released, um, you know, uh, a lot of energy and, and, and it had to go somewhere. He said, you know, when you do this stuff, he said, it, it just uh, creates a lot of energy and that energy has to go somewhere. So in Keating's case, you know, he um, worked tirelessly for uh, Contemplative Outreach, which is a, in, you know, international organization. Um, which uh, teaches centering prayer. And then he also wrote numerous books. Um, and I, I, I love his books. Um, you know, they, they've had a big impact on me. But, but yeah, he, he really was a, an amazing inspiration, uh, an amazing teacher. So in my metaphysical framework, when you say entering the room, you, you kind of just alter your energy, just alters, shifts, goes a bit deeper. Um, that's the mark of a very high vibrational person, um, a very high vibrational being. Can you talk to us a little bit about your um, your definition of Christian mysticism, like what that means to you? Um, yeah, and, and I like, Crystal, I like what you said about, um, you know, just when you enter into the room where this person is, you experience a different, uh, you could you could say vibration, you could say... Um, Brain state. Depth of consciousness, or mm -hmm. what was the other thing you said? Brain state. Brain state, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, 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 uh, in India, they refer to this as, as darshan and, and darshan, uh, is basically, you know, being in the presence of a master and, uh, and you mentioned Anthony DeMello, um, you know, I, there's so many others in, in Christian tradition. Um, you know, I, I think people say that about Joan Chittister and, um, and, you know, and, and Cynthia Bourgeau and, um, and there's a there's a number of teachers, you know, who um, who people have that kind of experience when they're when they're in that in the presence, and you know it's one thing to to teach, um, you know, using verbiage and and language and so on, but it's another thing in a much deeper thing I, I think to teach with presence. So. Um, uh, I think I lost track of your question. Though, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, okay. so in, I'm so enthralled with the idea. No, I was just asking about Christian mysticism and what yes. that means, what that means to you. Because, what's the difference between that and, say, evangelical Christianity or fundamentalist Christianity? Right, right. Well, I, I like, a, you know, I, I like um, 
you know, the, this quotation that um, we shouldn't be sh scared by the word mysticism. It basically just means moving beyond belief systems and belonging systems uh, to actual experience. Um, and so, so you know, it, it's, it's moving from, um, you know, reading in First John, uh, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was God and the word was with God and so on. And then actually experiencing that word within yourself that, um, that, you know, that there is that of God within us, uh, it says in Luke's gospel and says in John. And, uh, and so it's, it's going from that, um, the, the, just taking that long journey from, from the head, you know, into the heart and, and actually experiencing something, making it your own. It's one thing to read about the resurrection, right? But to experience that kind of transformative experience in your own life, where you have in some sense died and, and you have been reborn, it's just totally different. You know, it's, it's a whole different approach to the tradition. And of course, I, I believe that experiential approach is the deepest approach uh, to the tradition. Are you speaking of, you're speaking of gnosis here, essentially, right? So knowledge through knowing and experiencing and feeling, as opposed to just head knowledge, but just knowing it inside of you, just your personal witnessing testimony embodied. Is this what you mean by, by that? Well, well, you know, what, what happens after um, a lot of uh, centering prayer in, in centering prayer, you know, Thomas Keating always based on Matthew 6, 6, you know, which is go into your room. Uh, your private room and and shut the door. That means shut the door to the senses. You're no longer looking at anything. You're not tasting anything, smelling anything, hearing anything. Um, and you uh, you know you sit with your thoughts. And my my favorite um, you know my my favorite metaphor for um, for uh, meditation is that you're you're looking at boats that are coming down a river. And each boat is a different thought. And some, uh, some boats are very enticing and, and you get drawn into the boat and, and the boat has a lot of color, a lot of flair, and it really draws in your attention. And, and you, you get almost obsessed with that boat for a while. But in, in meditation and in centering prayer, what happens is you, you just um, pay less and less attention you know, to each boat, you just let the boat come, you let the boats go, right? And then what starts to happen is that there's fewer and fewer boats on the river, because you're, you're not giving them that energy anymore. You're not, you're not letting them, you know, occupy your mind with so much, you know, uh, of, of your um, awareness. So there, there begins to be fewer and fewer boats. Um, and another way you can say that is, uh, you know, that in between your thoughts, there's a space. And the, the purpose of, of centering prayer is really to extend that space in between the thoughts. And then the same way, so you, you're extending the space in between the boats. But then what happens if you, if you do centering prayer for enough months and, and you really, um, you know, treat it as a discipline like you would any other, like playing the violin or, or something, um, over time, there, there's, there's just so few boats that um, your, your mind starts to get drawn into what carries all the boats, which is the water beneath. And um, that's the stream of consciousness that, that carries every single thought. And it's much deeper than the boats. Um, it's much more pervasive. Um, and in, in, it's also much more satisfying. And it, it, and it really appeals to us on a very profound level. We start to feel like, you know, I've, I've come home. You know, I'm, I, I'm no longer addicted to these thoughts. I'm no longer addicted to, you know, staring at these boats all the time. I, I'm finally starting to feel some, some genuine peace. And so that's, um, you know, that's what we're, you know, that, that's, that's the experience um, that, that I, I, I think we, we thirst for, um, but, but most people don't find it. And, um, and so then they, they chase after peace in, in places that, that ultimately cannot give it. How long did it take you upon starting your practice of centering prayer before you got to this space of the ocean or this, this deep well that you're 
you're you're speaking of how long if uh, how long chasing the boats well so so one one indicator that you know th that you're really starting to go deeply is when uh, there's something that happens in the centering prayer community they, they refer to it as unloading and and what happens is because you're in such a relaxed state much much more relaxed than than sleep a much a much deeper relaxation than sleep the, the muscles that are that are tense in your body uh, begin to um, to release their tension. And so it, it might be experienced as uh, shooting pains in your body. It could be um, experienced, some people experience it as shaking, like, like an arm will just start to shake. Um, people experience unloading in different ways, but, but it's well known within the community that this is what happens. And what's happening is that you're, all throughout your life, you have what, whatever, um, uh, desires that haven't been fulfilled and frustrations and so on since childhood have been translated into bodily tension. Mm -hmm. And so the body starts to release its tension and, and the tension in the muscles begins to release. And, and then the nervous system begins to heal. And it's a, um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. And I guess, I guess for me, it, it, it didn't really happen on a profound level until um, until 2008. Um, and that's when I was at a 10 day retreat at St. Ben Benedict's monastery. I experienced, uh, a, a much deeper, uh, you know, a much deeper silence, um, much more spacious, um, much more, um, um, free than, than, than I'd ever experienced before. And the unloading was also more intense at, at that retreat. Um, I used to hold a lot of tension in my back and in my jaw. And uh, since that retreat in 2008, uh, most of that tension, that bodily tension has, has gone away. And um, it, it's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to explain, um, you know, but it, but it's, uh, it's given me just a whole different way of, of uh, being in the world. Um, you know, I'm not carrying all that tension around, uh, and, and that's one of the beauties of, of Centering Prayer. Well, um, can you teach us Centering Prayer? Is that a complicated process? Is it something that's simple? Like, I, I know that it's a meditation and I know it's right. about focusing, but I mean, like, what is the, the, what are the steps to get into this prayer, if you would be so kind? Sure. Um, well, well, yeah, let's let's share the steps, but maybe um, maybe also just a couple of analogies. Um, okay. One is, uh, you know, if if you try to train a puppy to sit in the middle of the circle, right? You 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 put a you make a circle out of tape and you put the puppy in the center. What the puppy will do is it will constantly wander. That's the nature of the puppy. It, it, that's just that's what it knows how to do it will wander so what you do is you gently bring the puppy back to the center of the circle and then it wanders again and then you gently bring it back and then it wanders again and then you gently bring it back and that is the practice of, of centering prayer really is is doing that it's it becomes why a lot of people quit and why a lot of people don't continue with it or take it you know or or really you know, it doesn't become the discipline that it should become is because it feels so monotonous, you know, bringing this puppy back over and over and over again, training the mind, basically, what will happen over time, and it will be a triumph when it does happen, is the puppy will stay in the middle of the circle for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and then over time, maybe 30 seconds, and then over time, maybe a minute. And it's like the first time that the mind has broken its addiction of, of constant, constant thoughts, you know, constant, constant wandering, because that's the nature of the mind. It just constantly wanders. One meditation teacher, I think it was Anthony, Anthony DeMello, he, uh, he said, if, if we had as much control um, over our legs as we do, um, you know, our minds, uh, we wouldn't be able to walk. I mean, the, the reality is that, that people have very little control over their minds. They're, you know, the, the average uh, human mind, I think, has a new incoming thought every three to four seconds. So to, uh, you know, to let go of that process um, of, of, you know, 
of thinking, which is connected to, um, you know, binaries, which is connected to dualistic, uh, you know, uh, approach, because every time you say even a word, right, or you have a thought, there's always the opposite. And so you never enter into a space of freedom, which is beyond, uh, you know, thinking beyond binaries, beyond, uh, you know, all the uh, gridlock of, of uh, you know, tension that exists in the body and in the mind. So anyway, that's that's just a uh, that's just an analogy for us is, is the analogy of the puppy. But let's yeah, let's uh, th thanks, Crystal, for asking about the technique. So the, so the technique is uh, very simple. We uh, we choose a, um, a sacred word. Um, now my, my sacred word is rest. And, um, and, and that comes from, uh, the gospel where Jesus says, you know, come, come to me, you who are, you know, stressed and heavy laden, my translation, um, and I will give you rest. Right. Um, and so that, that's my, that's my sacred word. Um, and, and so then what we do as, as we're sitting is uh, we just find our center, we find our, our silence. And then if we uh, start ha having a, an ongoing thought process, we use the sacred word, in my case, the word rest, to bring our mind back to our center. And the, the, the shorter the sacred word, the better. So, so Mary is a good sacred word, Jesus is a good sacred word, peace, um, shalom. Uh, there's many different uh, sacred words that you know work for different people. Um, but uh, but just just one last thing about it, you know in terms of teaching centering prayer. Let's just say that you're sitting in meditation, and it's before lunch, and the thought enters your mind that I'm going to have lunch after I meditate, and I am going to have an avocado sandwich. Okay, so that's that's fine. You don't even need your sacred word for that. You you have the thought, and then you let it go, and and you're 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 just fine. But what the sacred word is designed for is when you have a runaway train of thought. Okay, now so here's another example. You're sitting here before lunch, and all of a sudden you think to yourself, "I want to have lunch," and when I have lunch, I'm going to have an avocado sandwich. And then you think to yourself, "Are those avocados? Are they ripe yet?" I think that maybe they're not ripe yet. Man, that would be a bummer. And, um, and you know, those sprouts, they were really good like two days ago, but I don't know, maybe they're just slightly brown now. I, I just wonder, oh, I, I really like to look inside the refrigerator and see, um, I don't even know about that sourdough bread. Do I still have that? Because I, I mean, I, I know I had it a few days ago, but then I had that friend over, um, you know, it's so, so see what's happening is now you're on a whole like train of thought about the avocado sandwich and about lunch. And you're no longer, you're no longer meditating really at all. That's when you need your sacred word. And so in the middle of that, you recognize, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm off on a tangent. And then you say your sacred word, you say, okay, rest. And, and then you come back to that quiet center and, and you go back to just kind of observing your thoughts and you might have a, you know, a couple of thoughts that come like, you know, oh, I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to call Sally. Uh, and then you just let it go, right? You don't, you don't start getting all wound up in that thought, uh, you know, tangent either. You just let it go. And then over time, what happens is you have fewer and fewer thought tangents. And you find, you find that the body uh, just relaxes on a much deeper level than you've experienced before and it's very rejuvenating very revitalizing um and uh and gives you a lot of energy also so for someone just starting out who wants to try this how long should they sit there and do this uh, in the beginning like what would you recommend like 15 minutes we do this a half an hour is there a minimum or a maximum so uh, what, what I recommend um, is that you take out your calendar, right? And January 1st is coming up. And just, just a very simple thing. Just meditate for as long as you can stand um, every day in January. That, that's all. Don't, don't put a time on it because you'll, you'll, you'll basically, I mean, I, I've worked with people and, and they'll just throw up their arms after a while. Just, just do it as much as you can every day. Now, if you sit down on your cushion or your chair one day, and you can only meditate, you can only do centering prayer for like two minutes, fine, 
you sat on your cushion, you did it. You, that's good, right? You can put a check on that day in your calendar. And, and then really the, um, the goal is just to have every day, uh, that's 30 days of, of a calendar, um, checked that you sat every single day. Right. And then uh, after you do that um, for, for the next month, let's say February, sit two times and, and this time do the same thing again. Just sit as long as you can stand. I, I mean, ideally, uh, you know, it, when you're starting out, I, I think you want to, I, I don't know, you want to do at least uh, 10 minutes uh, each time. But if you do just uh, just three, you know, uh, that, that's OK. Um, and then basically build up to what what the goal that Thomas Keating has for people, which which is very effective, which is um, 20 minutes twice a day. But you can't get there in just a month. Uh, you got to give yourself time. And I think the daily repetition of it is more important than how much time you do. it. OK, interesting. All right. But that's that feels like it's simple. It feels like it's doable. But you're saying um it, but it might be a bit, a bit difficult <laughs> and to expect that maybe a little bit, right? Well, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have a Buddhist friend and, and he said, you know, the, the, real, the real clear sign that you're doing uh, Dharma is that it's, uh, it's infinitely simple. I mean, what could be more simple than sitting in silence and doing nothing, right? And it's infinitely difficult. He said, if, if there's those two criteria, you know that you're doing, you're doing Dharma. You know, you're, you're, you're actually doing uh, a deep practice. If it's not infinitely difficult and if it's not infinitely simple, it's probably not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, like, I like what my friend said, too. He said, uh, you know, that one time, um, uh, one time Gautama the Buddha apparently uh, was, was teaching somebody. And, um, and, and the, the person asked, you know, uh, Gautama, how should, I, how should I practice? And they overheard this, uh, this teacher of, of sitar, uh, like, you know, about 100 feet away. And what the teacher of sitar was saying is, if you tighten the strings too tight, they will snap. But if the strings are too loose, then it won't play, right? So that's basically how you want to practice centering prayer. Don't be overly disciplined because it's not going to have longevity. But don't be so loosey goosey that you're just skipping your, you know, you're you're skipping your uh, centering prayer sessions uh, on a regular basis. You have to you have to have something in between, you know. So, Amos, a lot of my listeners are metaphysical, super interfaith, ecumenical. We've got a lot of different people um, all over the spectrum. I know this is something that is, I guess, originated from. A Christian man, Father Keating, but would you say this is something that anybody can do? Are other faiths welcome to do this? And also kind of feels a little bit like mantras. I mean, I'm sure that that comparison has been drawn as well, although you tend to deal with a mantra a little differently. But so can people other than Christians have success with centering prayer? So I would say if somebody is interested in mantra and if somebody has history and background with mantra, the form of Christian meditation that you want to get into is uh, Christian meditation um, that was originated by uh, John Main. Okay. And, and its, uh, its center is in London. And it's, uh, but it's international. And it's, uh, and it's, it's basically called uh, Christian meditation. So okay. if you were to do a Google search of Christian meditation, you, you would, uh, I'm sure, find uh, a lot of detail on that. Can you tell us if, a little bit about what, what that looks like or how that's a little different than what you're talking about? Yeah. So, so in Christian meditation, it's actually very different. Um, so, so there was a, uh, there was a Benedictine monk, his name was John Main, and uh, he went to India and he, uh, he talked to some uh, people who were experts in mantra, who were also Christian. And, uh, and together they, they developed a, a, a mantra, which uh, apparently when it comes to the linguistics is, is about as perfect as it, as it gets. And the mantra is Maranatha. And Maranatha uh, means come Lord Jesus mm -hmm. in Greek. 
And so uh, in Christian meditation, they will uh, repeat this mantra over and over again. And that is the meditation. So for 20 minutes, they will, you know, with eyes closed, they will basically say in their, in, in, you know, internally, they'll say Maranatha, 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 Maranatha. And the the syllables and and the sounds of Maranatha help to to go to a deep place, um, and and I have a lot of respect for people who do Christian meditation uh, worldwide, um, and you know it, it's it's very um, you know it's very lively in in some communities. There's a lot of practitioners of uh, of Christian meditation, but the uh, yeah so so as far as centering prayer is concerned. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's a practice that that uh, you can start um, no matter what background you come from. Um, I mean, when you get into a lot of the centering prayer literature, uh, all of it has uh, you know Christian overtones and and you know a lot of in, in a lot of just uh, Christian mysticism there. Um, but uh, the experience I think is primary, and and you could also choose a a mantra that that it has no offense to you that works well for you uh, that you know that that feels because it has to feel right it has to be something that feels really good to you um and it doesn't have to be something that's you know laden with a lot of theology or or whatever so interesting so i know with transcendental meditation isn't that don't they also like after you go through all of the processes they kind of you get to select a word or select a phrase, and that's the phrase that you center upon. Or maybe it's a mantra. Maybe it's more um, actually in alignment with Christian meditation. But it just seems to be a lot of interesting intersectioning intersections in these different types of meditation. But maybe it's just your mileage will vary. It depends on what works for you and the outcomes for you that you are looking for. And yeah, and, and what I what I might say is actually centering prayer requires more discipline, I think. Okay. I, I know I'm, I'm probably, <laughs> if people hear this, they, you know, especially. I'm, I love it. I love to hear this. So do go on. Okay. okay. So, so centering prayer requires more discipline, I think, because you don't have a word that you can just hang on to, right? And you have to go into deep silences, which are very uncomfortable for most people, including me at the beginning. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is try centering prayer, and if it doesn't work for you, then try Christian meditation. Um, th that that would be my recommendation. I, I know I might get some flack for that, <laughs> but 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 that would be my recommendation. Can you listen to music when you do centering prayer, or is it absolute silence, just the mind? Well, Crystal, I noticed that you had that uh, you know that very uh, kind of peaceful uh, yes you, you know music my my wife likes to to put on uh you know celtic music and and I, I, there's something about the celtic music that she plays that i just i love um but but really the point you know and it gets back to matthew 6 6 is right you, you're shutting the doors uh to all the senses and and this is a this is an important point that that there's uh there's really two a different paths of consciousness and of reality one is of the senses and one is not of the senses. So the path that is of the senses, right? Um, it is uh, basically, um, it's, you know, it's very unsatisfactory because you, like, for example, my, my son, you know, sees that uh, cotton candy, right? And, and you get him the cotton candy at the fair and he's, he's eating on the cotton candy and then it's, and then it's gone. And then, so there's a, there's a feeling of, of, uh, you know, of anticipation and, and, you know, this desire for it when you don't have it. And then when it's gone, there's like this longing, like, like this remorse, like it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's gone, you know, I don't have it anymore. Um, but, but those experiences that are not of the senses, which uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox tradition refers to as the spiritual faculties, um, those uh, are, are categorically different. They're not tied to the senses. And they only, they only come when uh, we don't, we're not bombarded by any kind of other sensory stimulation. So there's nothing for our eyes to look at. There's, there's, you know, no taste, there's nothing to listen to. And, and in that um, absence of any kind of sensory stimulation, 
uh, th there comes something else that emerges that is even more satisfying than what the senses can give us. Thomas Keating used to say that, that you know, the experiences you have in centering prayer, I, I mean, the senses just cannot keep, compete with it. You know, the, the, the pleasures of the senses, even when it comes to physical intimacy and, and, and all the kinds of things that our society you know, kind of lifts up, they, you know, you cannot compete with this, with this profound uh, silence and the consolations that come from, from uh, that, that total peace. So. I remember, well, I do all kinds of different meditation. Um, but when I was first really starting out, just trying to find my way with it, I always preferred sensory deprivation. I'd have something over my eyes. I'd have something over my ears. I was not listening to anything. And um, those were the types of experiences and continue to be where I actually had so much phenomena happening on the inside of me. Like all of a sudden it felt like there was a sunbeam right on my face. Like there was just a flashlight right on my face and I would kind of come to the surface. I'd take my thing off and there's, you know, I'm sitting in a dark room, it's not happening. I go back down and all of a sudden I'd hear something like a siren or I'd hear music or I'd hear like what sounded like weather happening. And so I take off my thing, look around and it's all happening inside of me. It was, it was wild and continues to be wild. Can you comment on some of the th things that you've experienced? Because I think that, well, let me just say this. I also think that those can be very distracting. <laughs> like you can say, wow, I had such a cool evidence. It's not the point. It's part of the journey that you're taking. Um, so I tried not to be distracted by the siren or distracted by the sunbeam and continue to go deeper and deeper. And that was the challenge for me. Um, but can you speak to some of, of these types of evidences that happen when you're meditating and what you've experienced when you're way down deep in there? Well, so the, you know, we talked about unloading, um, which is referred to in, in the centering prayer community. And, you know, it, it's when you have tension in your body that um, is, is trying to, to release itself because you're in such a deep state of relaxation. And I, I can say that there were a number of times when I had a, a knot that was in my stomach and it was excruciating. And I didn't think I was going to be able to get through it, but I just concentrated on my breath. And then I, I started to have a, um, a reaction that, that feels a lot, well, there was a lot of nausea and I, and I, it was, it felt like I was, I was going to, going to vomit. Um, and, uh, and this went on for, for some time and, and, uh, you know, and some people in the center of prayer community have said when those things happen, they, they just can't handle it. They, they'll, they'll get up from their chair, they'll, they'll, they'll run around, they'll, they'll try, try and I, but I, I had enough discipline, I, I think, you know, for, because of my history of being an athlete that I, I just kind of, I, I just kind of hung in there with the pain. And, and then what would happen is once, once the nausea and, and the, the excruciating tension, uh, it, it would start to kind of break up and then it would release. And then I, I would just feel such an extraordinary like uh, release, like like I just let go of a burden and, and I, I, my whole body felt more light. And I, and I just was like, so relieved. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I guess a little bit like somebody when, when they really need to vomit, you know, once, once you get it all out, you just feel so much relief. And, um, and so those are, you know, those are the experiences that, that I've had. Um, and Why the nausea do you think? I hear this from so many people and a profound disorientation. And to me, um, in my woo-woo mind, I'm thinking, am I like out of my body a little bit? And so maybe there's a disorientation being in the physical, but also being in the spirit. Maybe I'm making some sort of a transit, but I'm, I'm wondering why you think we experience those kinds of like physical symptoms while we're meditating. Other than the unloading, just the letting down of the muscles and the body going through shifts and changes. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I really, I, I don't separate out the spiritual and the physical. I, I think that the, the body mind is much more profound, much more ancient, much more multi-layered, much more mysterious than anybody really gives it credit. So, so the body mind itself is a profound, uh, you know, uh, uh, organism. And 
and and there's there's other ways that the body mind uh, releases toxins. Um, the reason why you sweat and and the sweat glands is is because you release toxins through your pores. Um, the reason why you um, you eliminate um, you know uh, toxins and uh, and refuse uh, you know uh, through through your bowels is is also is the body uh, letting go of toxins right um, and and of course the same is true of of other di your digestive tract and and release. Uh, whatever needs to be released uh, through the urinary uh, tract. Um, but, but the body also has this process of, of, you know, if you go deep enough in silence and you allow the body to relax enough, um, that it will start to release deep-seated tensions uh, throughout your body. And in time, uh, be, when all of your tensions are released, um, you know, there will be uh, you know, a healed nervous system and, and a whole different paradigm, a whole different way of being. Uh, one, one story that I, I like to share is, is a friend of mine that I ran into when I, I went to see Thich Nhat Hanh uh, one time. And um, he was a massage therapist. And he said that he had been to Plum Village and he had, you know, been there with Thich Nhat Hanh. And uh, he asked Thich Nhat Hanh, he said, can I give you a massage? Now, usually a, a Buddhist monk would say, no, I, I, they won't accept a massage. It's just part of their code. But for whatever reason, Thich Nhat Hanh in this particular day, it, I, I don't know why, he said, okay, sure. Uh, this one time, uh, you can go ahead. You can give me a massage. So the massage therapist massaged Thich Nhat Hanh. And he said he was just blown away. It, it just changed his whole paradigm. Every single person he'd ever massaged in 20 years of experience always had tension somewhere in the body. Thich Nhat Hanh was loose as a goose. He had no tension anywhere, anywhere in his body, nothing. I mean, I mean, he this this massage therapist didn't even realize that this was even possible. Like, how can this be? Is it? I mean, am I am I hallucinating? No, that is what meditation does. Is it is it clears out? You know, I'm talking about these different ways of removing toxins in your body and so on. It clears out the tension in your nervous system so that you can uh, fully relax and be fully present. Amazing! I'm really excited. Um, talking with you just about everything. Um, and I could go on and on and on about centering prayer, but I did want to make sure that I ask you about the Jesus paradox. Um, because looking into you, I know that that's something that you talk about. And I would like to know what what is the Jesus paradox? Um, so we have a tendency as humans to put the divine with a capital D out there somewhere that we worship, right? We put it on an altar and we worship it, but it's not really in us. It's something out there that we're worshiping, right? And then uh, the things that are human, the things that are messy, the things that are uncomfortable, the things that are, you know, uh, the traumas we've had in our life and most adults I, I know have all had that. Um, you know, we, we say that, that that's human and we're, we're, we're somehow human, right? Um, and that's just part of being human. But, but the beauty of the Gospels, if you really read a little bit more deeply, is that, um, you know, Jesus had a really bad day one time, uh, and, and it's recorded in all the Gospels, and, and he was so mad that he, he cursed the fig tree, right? And that, that's like something I would do on a bad day, curse the fig tree, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then he has, but, but then, you know, these people come up and, and just by touching the hem of his garment, they come yes. away whole and they're totally healed. Right. So there's this paradox in Jesus. Jesus is human, but with a lowercase age, with, with all of the things, including mortality uh, that go along with it. But then he's also divine with a capital D. And so um, what, what I like to try to get people to do is, is, is if you see Jesus in that way more and more, and I think it's seeing Jesus more clearly, more authentically, more, more integrated, right, uh, as a paradox, which, which is what Jesus is, then we start to see that in ourselves. And we start to see that, you know, we also have both natures, that we have this human nature, um, and, we, and we also have this divine nature. That, that we are of the creator with a capital C, but we're also of the creature. We are uh, mortal, but we are also eternal. We are, um, you know, divine, and maybe in our case, we can say lowercase d, you know, divine. Uh, we're also human. That that's really getting to the depths of, of who we really are. And people who try to separate those two out, uh, I think they they miss the the real mystery there the 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 um, you know the essence of, of what we're seeking.
So, um, so that's the Jesus paradox, and, and I, I think that yes, it exists in, in Jesus of Nazareth, uh, who walked the earth two thousand years ago, but that that imprint, that of God within us, you know, it says in Genesis, uh, we are created in God's image. That that is also in us, and if we uh, if we neglect or uh, or deny our, our divinity. Um, then, then we are living a more compartmentalized life. We, we're not a, not a whole life because our our we because because our totality is includes the divine, um, and and it's um, it, it's a mysterious and dynamic, um, uh, you know, interchange. I mean, the sense says throughout the Gospel of John, you know, in John 17, John 18, it says that you are in me and I am in you, you know, and and that's, um, you know, that the, the, there there is this possibility of of connecting with something mysterious and beautiful and profound um, within us that um, has been there since the beginning of time, and that is um, enveloped in light. And that is uh, healing, and it is spacious. That is generous beyond any generosity we will know on this earth, and um, which is, um, you know, the the reason we're here. I think. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I I was I grew up as a fundamentalist Christian, <clears throat> super literalist. I was a missionary. Um, knew all the Bible scriptures and um, at some point had to uncouple from organized religion and go wandering for a while. But I found my way back full circle, but just to Jesus and kind of seeking to get a better understanding of who he was and how I relate to him, you know, and how he relates to me. And the, the one instance that I go back to time and time again in terms of his humanity and divinity is uh, the Garden of Gethsemane where he's, you know, he's afraid and he knows what's coming. And he asks his friends, can you just stay up? And of course they fall asleep <laughs> and he's alone and he's, he prays. And um, I just, I feel such a connection with him in that moment because he, I mean, I just, how to exist, you know, how to exist in, in, in what you've come to fulfill, but as a human being in that moment, like on the eve of this, it's just so profound to me. And I don't, I you can't even really approach what Christ himself must have been feeling, but the humanity there, you know, but also God's presence and his reliance is just a reliance on trusting, like if it's in your will, but if not, thy will be done, you know, it's just a, that's um, that integrated Jesus that you're talking about, the human and the divine, the Jesus who did have a bad day and he turned over a table or two and he told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, bud, beat it, right? This is a human being, but he's also, he's also, well, do you believe Jesus is God, son of God? Is there a difference there for you? Use the word, yeah, the word was yeah, with God. What, well, I, well, I, I like, um, so so somebody asked um athanasius said so how is how is jesus uh, equal to god and uh, and i thought athanasius's response was 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 profound he said um as sight is equal to the eyes oh, that's really good <laughs> that is really good thank you yeah. okay um I did want to ask you one other question if you have the time and it's just um your history as a quaker um i don't know much about this i i i think they quaked and i think that it was an ec ecstatic situation going on i'm not quite sure what was going on with with them can you tell us a little bit about quakerism and how that do you, are you still a quaker what does that mean so, um, so yeah, I was I was a part of Santa Cruz Friends Meeting uh, in the 1990s, and I was a member. Um, I, you know, got involved with some other, you know, uh, another denomination for a while. But I've been a Quaker now for uh, for about four years, and um, and and the beauty of Quakerism to me is that they they believe that the silence is sacred, and so in 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 the FGC, which is the Friends General Conference, right? Uh, these are the Quakers who meet in silence. Um, 
we come together uh, on Sundays and we sit in silence for an hour. And there's something about the collective silence, which is, is really amazing. And uh, there's what the Quakers refer to as a gathered meeting. Now, a gathered meeting is when everyone is in the silence and you feel, you feel that it's, it's connected, that, that it's collective. It's not just the individual uh, in silence, but we're all enveloped in this sacred silence. So, um, so yeah, I, I love the Quaker tradition. My, my mother uh, had a lot of Quaker leanings and she went to, you know, Quaker meetings uh, um, many times throughout her life. And uh, yeah, it's, it's where I find myself now. You know, if somebody asked me, you know, who are you, what are you, uh, and so on. And, and I would say, you know, I'm a contemplative Quaker. That's what I am. Is there any quaking that happens? <laughs> so, so originally, yeah, how they got the name is that when they, when these, they sat in silence. Now, interestingly, this, I think it was unloading, right? Because mm, okay. there are people in the Centering Prayer community that when they go deep enough, they start to shake, right? So, so I, I personally think it's just a theory, okay? But, but I think that some of the early Quakers, when they were sitting for so long in silence, they started to quake, they started to shake. And so then uh, people started to refer, and at first it was derisive. It's like, it, it was kind of a, a put down, right? Oh, those Quakers, right? But over time, they, they, they accepted it as their own and they appreciated uh, the name and, and it, it stuck. And I think the same is, is true of the Shakers, you know, the, the, the two traditions in, um, you know, that, that in Christian tradition, which, which really value um, uh, discipline silences. How interesting. Unloading. That makes sense. Most definitely. All right. Well, so one, one thing I have to say, though, Crystal, is yeah. that I've, I've done a number of interviews, but I don't know what it is about you, but I, I have spoken more in depth <laughs> about more <laughs> stuff <laughs> with you than, than just about anybody. So um, so I, I really enjoyed this uh, this space, uh, you know, in, in your openness and willingness to, you know, to go to these places. Yeah, well, I'm so interested and I just find it, I mean, really curious that I've, you know, I've been to, I don't know if they're the the cabins at St. Benedict's where people go for silent retreats. I've walked all through them. I've walked all over that property yeah. um, a couple of times and I've just felt a magical connection there. And so I just was, I felt, I felt that uh, with you as well. Just really wanted to pick your brain about your experiences. Um, you, do you have two books or three books? Two books or three um, books? So I have two books. So this, this one was my, this is my first book and I, yeah, there you go. There, you go. there, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, and then this one is my second book. Um, yeah, this one here. Be uh, still and listen. Okay, yes. Right. Can you then, talk? Can you talk about who needs these books? Who do you think needs these books, and why? Um. Well, I you know I might start with this one if if you're gonna get one because it's it's very accessible. It's very short. Um, but but it basically just um you know, and it gets into centering prayer. And it, I guess if I were to, if I were to summarize most, uh, most essentially, my first book is about seeing Jesus with, um, with mystical eyes, right, that, that come as a result of lots and lots of centering prayer. And then the second book is about seeing scripture through mystical eyes after doing lots of centering prayer. Uh, my, my third book, which is called A Journey of Holistic Mysticism, uh, it's about seeing, you know, Quaker tradition and, and the Quaker teachers uh, through those eyes after, you know, after a lot of uh, centering prayer. So, Well, I think that um, we need this spiritual technology I and mean, it's been around forever and, and the kingdom of heaven is inside of us we've always had the apparatus but we truly need it now more than ever you know as you look out on the screen of our life and the world seems a little crazy right now and it seems like the answer is to engage with the maya or the the illusion of it right and get all reactive but truly the answer is to go within into these spaces and places that you've been describing today and that's where the freedom is that's those that's where the answers are I truly, truly believe that and I think more people need to engage in meditation and, as we've discussed it, centering prayer. So I know that you do retreats and, and you also do workshops. And can you talk a little bit about your work and how somebody might be able to connect with you if they wanted to go on this journey of centering prayer with you? Um, 
Well, uh, so so I should say the uh, the password for my website. I don't just kind of leave it open willy. Yeah, I went to it and I'm like, where I can't get in. I can't get. What yeah, are you right, doing right, in there? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so so the uh, the password is friends, and okay. friends is just one word, all lowercase. Um, you know, six. What is it? F R I E N D S. So seven letters. Um, so, uh, so that'll, you know, give you some more information there. Um, but then you can also just feel free to contact me uh, through the website and I will respond to you. Um, and, you know, if you have some questions about uh, maybe centering prayer retreats in your area or, um, you know, what, what you, because, because I, I really love to work with people who are trying to go deep. And as Crystal is saying, who actually are doing the countercultural thing of going within, mm -hmm. which I totally agree with Crystal. That's where it's at. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not uh, something out there that is going to bring you peace. It's, it's something within. So, um, so yes, if, if you want to contact me through the website, um, what is the website? So the website is rcmr5 dot org so that's r c m r five dot org and you know if you just want to get a hold of me without going through any websites or messing around my email address is a m o s which is my first name and then the first three letters of my last name which is s m i at gmail.com so that's a m o s s m i at gmail.com all right, and I will put the links to your email, to your website, and to uh, look into and purchase your books all in the description of this video and also in the description of this podcast. This has been a truly magical conversation. Amos, thank you so very much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and Crystal, I, I would love to talk to you again because I yeah, yeah. I feel like you, you definitely take the conversation to a different place than many people. So appreciate thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you.